Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Thoughts from the Other Side of the Pond, featuring Ali Valkyrie. Ali Valkyrie is a social activist, writer, artist, spirit worker, and co-founder of Gods and Radicals Press. Though she is a U.S. American citizen, she has been living in France for the last few years. We spoke on September 3rd about American exceptionalism, religious fundamentalism, political differences between the U.S. and Europe, the spirit of resistance in France, and the alarming rise of fascism in the U.S. We opened the discussion with an excerpt from a recent essay she wrote for Gods and Radicals called Thoughts from the Other Side of the Pond. Yeah, I wanted to read a paragraph from a recent essay that you wrote and start from there, if you don't mind that idea. Okay. Of course. So this is from your most recent essay, which was Thoughts from the Other Side of the Pond. Mm -hmm. And you wrote, perhaps the United States cannot be saved. Perhaps even with the best of efforts, even in the best of circumstances, it is too dysfunctional to ever live up to its theoretical promises. Perhaps when it comes to everyone, as opposed to only cis white men, the American dream is simply that, a dream, never to be fulfilled, never to actually come true. Perhaps the combination of its size, its composition, the way it was th- the, in which it was settled, the utter lack of cohesiveness across regional borders, and hundreds of years worth of ideological poison have resulted in an experiment that's best left abandoned as it stands. Perhaps the only feasible option is to start anew, this time rooted from an acknowledgement that the entire project exists on stolen land and that the descendants of the original inhabitants need to be centered first and foremost in any rebuilding effort. Perhaps the United States needs to fall, and perhaps, just perhaps, it never should have existed in the first place. I had a lot of perhaps in there. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, you're using it obviously as a, you know, as a, um, uh, like a literary technique. Yeah, or whatever, but also you know? just, you know, just a bit of a cushion, you yeah. know, I mean, these are, these are thoughts, you know, I, I argue with myself constantly. There are certain days where I believe that absolutely unreservedly, unreservedly. Um, there are other days where, you know, I want to hold out hope because, you know, I was socialized into the American project as much as anyone else born and raised there. And you can never completely shake off your ideological ideological socialization as as much as we want to, as much as we want to pretend we can. Um, you know, it's like religion; you can never <laughs> completely rid yourself of it. Right? Yeah. No, I, I I wonder about that a lot too. And you know, some people will use the phrase, for example, uh, "recovering Catholic." You know? Totally. Yeah. Oh, I'm a rec- I'm a recovering American. That's how I totally. You know, and when it comes to just so much of American ideology, I mean, especially, you know, American exceptionalism, to me, that's the one, the degree to which I never realized how much I would have to constantly be rooting that out before I moved here. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it, it is a life, I mean, it, it's, I compare it, I compare it to kind of uh, latent racism, where, you know, you spend your whole life unlearning it, something you didn't even ever consciously learn, you just absorbed from what's around you. But I'm constantly coming across my own ideas of exception, you know, in the same way that, you know, I declare myself an anti-racist and I know I'm still guilty of racist ideas. You know, I, I, I openly speak out against American exceptionalism. I mean, that's what that whole essay was. In many ways, it was a condemnation of American exceptionalism encapsulized in the idea that, you know, America deserves to survive and thrive because, you know, it's the greatest idea that ever was. Um, that's just, that's something that's so deeply hammered into us and it takes, oh, you know, I, I started to unpack that, you know, in my late teens and early twenties and I really thought I had unpacked it, um, by my early thirties, but 
I'm sitting here nearly a decade later, like, nope, <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. I'm I'm 51 this year, and I still find that I'm still recovering from Catholicism, for example, mm -hmm. you know, even though I left the church when I was 16, you know, and you know, racism, certainly, I feel that one, too, that comes up. Sometimes it's surprising times, so like a, a thought or a feeling will go through my head, and I'm like, wow, I didn't put that there, and wow, that's ugly. Yeah, exactly. No, that's I deal with that racism. I deal with that with 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 American exceptionalism. Um, thankfully, my family, uh, we called ourselves fundamentally lapsed Catholics. And mm -hmm. that, you know, not only do we not go to church, but I wasn't allowed to pretty much. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, I, I don't have to sh shed a whole lot of that. But the cultural trappings were still there. Like the, 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 the guilt type, you know, I mean, we were, you know, half Italian, half Azorian. So we're still very Catholic in mind, um, even though I wasn't raised in the church. So, you know, I probably have less of that than you do, but I still find myself dealing with like really weird kind of guilt type things and this kind of, you know, big occasionally this this weird sensation that maybe I'm pissing off some sky god that I never paid attention to in the first place and you know, then I have to remind myself, well, there's plenty of sky gods and they're all in competition and maybe they're not paying attention to me at this moment. So, uh -huh. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the biblical one's not the only possibility. No, no, not only is he not the only possibility, but, you know, when you, when you look at how he, he's perceived, um, you know, he, he's spying on a whole lot of people all at once. And so I'm going to hope he's paying more attention to the true believers and... You know, I will get away with the fact that I forgot to pay for the garlic or, you know, whatever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hell. It's okay. Right, right. So um, in Europe, where you are now, because you're in, in Britannia, in, in France, mm -hmm. the uh, religion plays a much different role there than it does oh, yes. in the United States. So fascinating. You know, when, when people, especially, you know, as an American, when people, you know, if I have to give like the greatest cultural difference... Um, I usually tell people I've gone three and a half years without a single person ever trying to talk to me about Jesus. Wow. Right? Yeah. Ever. <laughs> I mean, even, even like we have Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They're on the street with their pamphlets, but they don't approach you. They wouldn't dare. They wouldn't dare. They wait until you approach. And if you approach them, sure, they'll, they'll talk, they'll talk to you about Jesus till they're blue in the face, but you will never be approached. I was realizing the other day I was I was on my bike in traffic behind cars and it hit me like, wow, I've never seen a Jesus bumper sticker. I've never seen any sort of religious bumper sticker. I've never even seen one of those coexist bumper stickers that, that they love to put on their car in, in liberal cities in the United States. Um, you, you just don't. It, it's just, you know, it, it, it's seen as it's, it's like talking about your sex life. It's just like, why? Why would you share that with other people unless they ask you? Like, why would you why would you be out about that? It's it's and it's interesting because when I talk to people who, you know, I mean, I inevitably end up in conversations about the United States constantly, whether I like it or not, because I speak French with an American accent. Mm. Um, and so, you know, very often people will be very um, eager to share with me their perception and their experience if, if they've gone to the United States. And, you know, and I'm always eager to listen. I mean, this is, you know, I'm, I'm a cultural observer at the end of the day. I'm always fascinated by how the United States is seen from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things they will say to me most often is, wow, you know, like people just won't shut up about Jesus. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Yeah." laughs> people won't shut up. But even the very idea, um, I mean, even, you know, President Obama, people loved Obama here. But they're super shocked when Obama would talk about God. Like, why, why is a politician bringing up God? It just, it doesn't make sense to people here. Even the far right, Marine Le Pen doesn't really talk about God. She knows it's just, it is such a deeply, deeply secular culture. Um, and the, the American obsession with religion is but probably, other than like the anti-intellectualism, I would say those are the two things that kind of confuse people here the most and or they're the most judgmental about. So you just mentioned Marie Le Pen, and I don't know the name of her party, but it's a very conservative party, right? Yes, it was. Um, well, it was the, the Front National, um, or the National Front in English, but she changed it because 
she's trying to like completely, you know, she's gone through a decade's worth of a very hardcore attempt at rebranding um, as her father, who's the party's founder, was a very uh, open anti-Semite Holocaust denier. Um, and she's, she's trying to do fascism light. So she's been kind of going out of her way to distance herself from the history of the party. So last year they renamed it um, the Rassemblement National. So the national, uh, how would you, uh, Rassemblement, it's like a, a group of people assemble. That would be a Rassemblement. So maybe it would be best translate as like the National Assembly. Um, right, but, but it's they, still, I mean, it doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't fool anybody. And whereas the newspapers will call it by the, the new name in terms of, you know, when I, when I talk to people on the street, it's still the FN. It's always going to be the FN. Like we don't want to, we don't want to let her get away with that rebranding. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really important to people who are opposed to fascism, which, you know, is most people that, you know, you don't erase history and you don't erase the roots. So, but with her party, with uh, there's not the same connection between the right wing politics and religion. No, 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 mm-hmm. no, definitely not. They, they, they import the same kind of values, right? She'll talk about things like, like traditional, like, like they're against gay marriage, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, although they're soft, they've softened on that. Um, they've softened on a lot of things to make themselves more politically pal- palatable. Um, you know, they're very kind of softly, um, I think she used to be much more hardcore anti-abortion, for example, and now she's not, um, they adopt a certain amount of that kind of like traditional family values thing, um, as that, you know, not because that just roots back to a division that's kind of always existed in French society between traditionalism and modernity. Um, that was, you know, for, for those who, who bought the lie, that was, um, much of the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Sometimes I forget English, the temptation, um, the appeal, the appeal is what I'm looking for of, mm-hmm. of Vichy France, of, of, of Pétain's government of occupied France, you know, that, that the emphasis on family and country, um, which, you know, like kind of nods back to a religious past, but with the religion itself taken out of it. Um, but you know, but on the other hand, that militant secularism gives the right of pass on Islamophobia. And that's where it does become kind of problematic. Um, oh, interesting. In society. Right. Like Marine Le Pen does not consider herself to be racist or Islamophobic by taking a hardcore stance against the wearing of the veil or the wearing of the burqa or any religious symbols in school. Because because in theory, it applies to everybody. And she's right. It applies to, you know, you 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 can't wear a yarmulke in public school any more than you can wear a veil in public school. I mean, she's she's correct in theory. But considering that, you know, Catholicism is still culturally dominating. um, I mean, it's hilarious. It's it's completely, you know, secular nation on one hand. But, you know, like every every two or three weeks, everyone gets a day off due to some Catholic holiday that, that, you know, nobody's actually celebrated for 200 years, but because it was always the day off, it's still the day off. Um, there's a whole lot of that, especially in May, like literally half, half of May, the entire country's on vacation between Easter and good Friday. And the like, I don't even remember again, I'm not raised Catholic. Um, but I keep, I have a little saints calendar just so I know when all the days off are, because if it's, if it's a day off, it means the grocery store is going to be closed. It means, you know, life stops for a day. And so as, as someone who's raised an American who's used to convenience, I want to know ahead of time if I can't buy milk. Um, right. <laughs> so I, I keep track of all those things, but yeah, but that, that's where it does become the problem is that the, the, the right wing uses the secularism to their advantage in order to push an, an Islamophobic agenda that, you know, it's really hard for people to argue with because, again, that, that secularism is so deeply ingrained in the culture. So it kind of it gives them somewhat of a free pass um, that, you know, in many ways, the people I see the most critical of it are folks like me or Americans are folks who were raised, you know, and again, it's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? America has religious freedom. No one would dare try to pass a law stopping someone from, from, you know, wearing a, 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 um, a, a headscarf in school. Um, but then, you know, we allow fundamentalist Christianity to run rampart rampant and we have a, you know, uh, an entire generation full of kids who have been homeschooled in a, a fundamentalist scenario where they're never taught about evolution. 
I mean, that's sure that doesn't happen here. Um, wow. <laughs> and when wow. and when French people learn about that, they're super, super shocked. There was a story here about the Quiverful movement. And I remember getting into a discussion with folks here about it, and they just couldn't they could not conceive that such a thing not only exists, but is you know, there's this entire world of of, you know, hardcore fundamentalist evangelicals who, you know, I mean, no different from any extremist sect, you know, and people here aren't afraid to say that, which is kind of, um, that's refreshing to me as an American, because mm -hmm. no one ever wants to call it an extremist sect in the United States, but here they'll say it. Um, but again, the, you know, the idea that, that children are raised, you know, not having access to the world, not having access to culture, you know, being completely protected from anything except a biblical education and then you know they turn 18 and if and when they ever want to escape that world they know nothing about the world outside um you know and america's full of those insular communities whether you know it's the amish whether it's you know the ultra orthodox um jewish communities in new york that i grew up around you know it we're full of that and it's kind of normalized in a sense because we so treasure religious freedom but, you know, as someone who now has lived in two places, I, you know, I, I see the good and the bad of, of both positions. Um, and there, you know, there's no panacea. You know, I, I prefer the, the secularization of France. Again, I love the fact that no one ever wants to talk to me about Jesus. That's just so refreshing. Oh, definitely. Um, <laughs> but I also think that it, it's really kind of fucked up that, you know, and, and what's happened, you know, the headscarf law, which is about two decades old now, I believe that was passed in the early 2000s, what they've shown through studies is that it has caused um, Muslim teenage girls to drop out at a much higher rate than they used to. They basically make a choice between staying in school or wearing the scarf. And especially if they come from conservative families, they choose to, to wear the scarf and they no longer go to school. Uh, so the, this was a, like a 9-11 a era law that got passed? I believe so. It, it was around. I don't know if it was before or after then. That's where I admit my, my specifics of the history are lacking. Mm -hmm. um, but it's around. Actually, you know what? I just realized I have this thing called the Internet. Um, <laughs> so let me I'm going to look it up. Yeah, right. When it exactly was. But, you know, but it, it was of, of, of that um, December 2003. It was, yeah, it was December 2003. So, yeah, right after 9-11. Um, I mean, that makes sense because there was so much Islamophobia that was so strong mm -hmm. for right after that. Yeah, I and mean, even says here in the, in the Wikipedia, the 2004 headscarf ban led to reduced socioeconomic integration of Muslim women in France. Mm. So, yeah, you know, it kind of had, you know, the intent was to assimil assimilate. And the reality is it, it caused the opposite. It, it caused a much more the separation of communities um people sticking to their traditional you know values from their home country versus you know and that's the you know the, the the thing about france as opposed to the united states that i find interesting is you know the united states is an amalgamation of so many cultures um you know that that map of like the 11 cultural regions of the united states like i find that very illuminating i don't think it's perfect but it, it goes a long way to explaining why, you know, you got parts of the country that, you know, will vote almost universally for for someone like Obama and then parts of the country where you can't look anywhere without seeing a, a, a Trump flag. Right. Mm -hmm. And we for better or for worse, there's never been any consensus on what it means to be an American there. We know it's, it's polarized. Right. You have That's the right idea mm -hmm. of what it means to be an American, mm -hmm. you know, flag wave and apple pie, NASCAR, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Um, and then you have kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't call them the left wing, um, but the more left side of the very right leaning political spectrum in the United States, um, where, you know, being an American is much more about, you know, individuality, you know, being able to forge your own path being open-minded about religion and race and, you know, not being a racist and not being a, a homophobe and not being a sexist. So, you know, there's these two very competing ideas um, of what it means to be an American. I think there's much less of a competing idea of what it means to be French. And that's one of the places where France and the idea of what it means to be French 
and people who come from Islamic cultures end up in this this um, um, you know headbutt, right? Um, because French being French means being secular. It means not wearing a headscarf. You know, it means not showing your religion as a badge in, in any in any form, really. Um, you know, uh, Jewish communities have historically had problems here as well with that. And, you know, and especially lately end up being targeted for for going out and, and being overtly and obviously religious. But but to be French is to be secular. According, I mean, not according to everybody, I would say, you know, there's absolutely not 100 percent consensus on that. But it's much more of an overall consensus on it than any idea of what it means to be an American. Yeah. And, and if, so that's yeah. where it becomes a controversy. Yeah. And it's well known yeah. that church attendance in Europe is much lower. Oh, my God. Than in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Churches are full of they're full of tourists. They mm -hmm. really are. I mean, it's like they still hold services. And, you know, and, and in some places and few of the, the I mean, you know, the churches here have I mean, I shouldn't say nobody goes. I'll go in. There's people in there. Um but but definitely, you know, the churches are open all day. You know, they keep the doors open all day long. The vast majority of people walking through there aren't doing so to bless themselves with holy water. They're doing so to take pictures um, or, you know, to gain some, you know, information of the history. You know, they're going on guided tours. Um, yeah, absolutely. The churches here fulfill a very, very different role. You know, and in France, most churches, they're, all, they're also they are owned by the state. The state appropriated um, I'm not sure of every single church, but I know like the vast majority of Catholic churches are our own. They are state owned. Um, the, the church does not make money off them. The church does not benefit. You know, the church is allowed to use them. You know, their priests are there. Um, but that's, that's interesting. That's state property. Yeah. That, that's that's different. Did that did that ownership get seized like during one of the revolutions? No, that was I believe in 1905. Oh, that happened. Yeah. Yep, that, that, that was just in the, in the past century. That is recent. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, that's one of the things, you know, for example, when the fire at Notre Dame happened mm -hmm. and the French government was soliciting donations, I heard American, the Americans constantly all over social media, why are you giving them money? The Catholic Church has so much money. Don't you know how much the Catholic Church had? I'm like, but they're not owned by the Catholic Church. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's actually owned by the French government, who, are, I mean, I'm not going to argue that the French government also doesn't have way too much money. But right. you're applying an American standard uh, to a French situation, which, you know, I mean, that's something I rant about. That's one of the primal, you know, cardinal sins of Americans, as far as I'm concerned, in every sense of the word, is that they, they have a terrible habit of, of universalizing what is normal in the United States and assuming that the way the rest of the world operates is the way that the United States operates. Um, that's a mistake. And that's a mistake on all sides of the political spectrum. Even the most radical leftists I know tend to make that mistake. And it's a mistake that people here resent greatly and deeply and loudly. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I see this one all, all the time. I saw it this morning. I mean, it's like not only is there the tendency to say that all people are like people are here, you know, that ev everyone's like Americans are, but that it's human nature to be mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Which really takes it a whole nother level. And oh, yeah. I feel, I feel like I'm constantly pushing back on that one, you know, like mm -hmm. there's the whole like, oh, humans are just a virus and they're overtaking the planet, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, there's indigenous cultures out there that exist, have always existed. Actually, they're kind of the default mode of existence <laughs> for humans. And they mm -hmm. have a totally different approach where they're not yeah. living in a virus like way. And it's like, it's like this strange, it's this uh it's a cynicism as well mm -hmm. as as well as being um ignorant. Right. Oh totally. And it's also I mean and, and people extend that for example when I hear Americans talk about, you know, the problems of, of capitalism and what capitalism causes in America, you know, they'll default it to the nature of capitalism. And I would say, well, you know, capitalism is a part of the problem. But American specific values are also part of a problem. You know, America has a severe homeless problem, yes, because of capitalism, but also because of a complete and utter lack of a social safety net and a Protestant value system that believes that if poor people are poor, it's because they didn't work hard enough. Uh, Finland is also a capitalist country and Finland pretty much completely solved their homeless problem 
um, not 100 percent, but but the vast majority of it by simply building and 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 providing houses to everyone who needs them. Because, again, there's a very different value system that underwrites that culture. And, and people really tend to think when they look at the worst excesses of American values, um, they tend to assume that that's human values. And it's like, no, I mean, you, you, we can narrow it. A lot of it, I would say, is, you know, Protestant rooted values. Yes. Um, but but they're also very United States specific Protestant rooted values, because, you know, at least in Europe, for better or for worse, often for worse, historically, there's always been constant pushback between Protestant values and Catholic values. Um, the United States never experienced that pushback. And so so much of the the, you know, the the roots of of the American value system is is rooted in, in this, you know, just Calvin and Luther, pretty, pretty raw and unedited. Um, right. without much, much other influence in there. Yeah, pretty much the English, really. Yeah, exactly. It's mm -hmm. and, and even in England, it's not as severe. That's what's fascinating. I always see the UK as always kind of a mid-ground uh -huh. between American values and continental European values. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in like, just so, like when you look at stuff like wealth and social policy, like, you know, the wealth gap in England is worse than Europe and not as bad, bad as the United States. Poverty in England, worse than continental Europe, not as bad as the United States. The homeless situation in Europe, same thing. The way that disabled are treated, same thing. The the healthcare system, the NHS is not as good, you know, for I mean, for reasons that could be fixed, of course, not as good as most continental European healthcare systems. Still better than the American healthcare system. So yeah, England kind of it, it's always this this interesting crossroads um <laughs> between between what's america and what's what's the rest of of continental europe which you know especially you know non scandinavian europe right um because you know scandinavia is also you know very much rooted in protestantism although still then they they still don't even hold those values as harshly and as unwaveringly as americans do um, you know, the Dutch will, will totally fetishize the idea of hard work, but they have a much better social safety net than the United States does. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if they, they believe that things like, you know, I mean, just universal health care, you know, it's not a political debate here. It isn't England. But in continental Europe, they don't have the right wing trying to take away health care. They wouldn't dare. It's just not seen as a politicized issue. It's just seen as a common sense basic human right why wouldn't you provide that why would you want people to die we don't want that you know? <laughs> no that's that's very interesting uh, to find out that even the right wing there is not opposed to that no oh no you know and, and so i mean and there's so many so many of the the issues that are politicized in the united states you know especially especially in france you know, they're, they're really not, I mean, there, there's probably a tiny little contingent that, you know, will bicker about aspects of it. But yeah, you know, you never hear politicians here talk about wanting to take away any sort of health care. I mean, the last presidential election, we had 12 candidates, not a single one denied climate change. Wow. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not, a, you know, how to solve it becomes somewhat of a political issue. Of course. But no one's going to deny it exists. That's science. Why would why would you deny scientific reality? Um, same with comprehensive sex ed. That's not a political issue. It, it's basic common sense. If you want to reduce abortion, if you want to reduce teen pregnancy, you teach people how the birds and the bees work and you make sure they have condoms. Like that's not no one would push <laughs> against that because it's basic common sense. And they look over at the United States like, what? what is wrong? Like, what, what? What's wrong with you people? They just they look over and they see this exercise in lunacy. Right. And, you know, and I always knew that to an extent when I lived in the U.S. But, you know, it's this constant gaslighting. It like it really it really took being out of that for an extended period of time and being able to be on the outside looking in that I was able to truly see how dysfunctional and absurd it was. Not that I didn't know when I was in it, but you know, when half your neighbors believe this one other thing, you know, it's, you're constantly second guessing yourself. You're constantly, you know, having to look and find your people, right? Find the people who agree with you. But when you have an entire country that believes in climate change and believes in, you know, condoms, um, it's super validating and refreshing and makes you realize that, you know, maybe, Maybe it's not you. Maybe there is truly a incredibly, incredibly deep social dysfunction in the country you were born and raised in.
<laughs> yeah, do you think? <laughs> yeah, and again, it's not that I it's not that I didn't know it. Yeah. You know, but you know, but it's another interesting piece where Americans are never forced Americans have this preconceived idea of how the rest of the country sees them. The rest and of the world, you mean? The rest of the world, yeah, sorry. Mm-hmm. And it's very removed from reality. I yeah, think they're that? starting to see that it's not the case. But, you know, it, it's very much the, the post-World War II, you know, we're the greatest country in the world and, you know, we saved Europe and, you know, everyone loves us and they all want Superman comics and, and they all want to be John Wayne. And, you know, and it's this whole, you know, the United States has this view of itself as, as you know, as the, the b- benevolent power, the peacemaking power. Um, the, the, you know, the, there's that big greatest country in the world, but especially like when it comes to, you know, cultural imports, you know, we have the best movies, we have the best TV shows, we have the best music. Um, and really, you know, and don't get me wrong. I mean, Hollywood makes some, some, some decent movies. And I, I admit a fondness for the, the latest, uh, Cardi B music video there. Um, hmm. but it's when you get out of it and, you know, I mean, especially, you know, the first time I forget the first time I went to Mexico and it was really just impressed upon me how much the United States it w- was seen as, you know, oh yeah, like they're the ones who destroyed our country with NAFTA. They're the ones responsible for the narco invasion because of their drug war. You know, when you, when you have to be face to face with people who are living the real life, everyday material effects of what your country has done, um, you start to realize that the impression that you were always given of how the world sees you is, is rather different than, than in reality. And I think, you know, and that changes from country to country. That's not, you know, I don't want to universalize that either. Um, and I think that also changes from government to government. How I was perceived as an American here under Obama was very different from how I'm perceived as an American here under Trump. Um, right. I'm, I'm much more on the defensive, to say the least. Um, I have to clarify my position at the forefront. Um, and I often deal with resentment and or sometimes outright discrimination, regardless of how much I try to make it clear that I'm not one of those Americans. Right. Right. And, you know, that's and I think that's something that just Americans abroad all over the world are are probably facing a whole lot more right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's more of a tendency like not since 9-11 when I talk to people who have lived abroad for a long time. Um, But definitely now more than ever. I mean, I, I can't have a burger at a fast food restaurant without somebody wanting to talk to me and, you know, and often airing their grievances to me, like I'm a priest and they're, you know, (laughs) or a therapist and they just, they need to, they need, they need to let me know how upset they are. And that's, you know, it's kind of an awkward position to be in sometimes, especially when you just want to enjoy your burger. Um, but you know, my whole thing is, well, you know, they're giving me free health care. I, I guess I will be the receptacle to the criticisms of the American Empire. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, you know, straight off. I, I, I'm glad you you brought up all these 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 particular things because, of course, this time you know we're you know it's it's early September now, and I'm not sure when this will when this will be uploaded. Uh, sometime in September, probably. Uh, but you know, we're in that time of of when um, the U S is more obsessed with itself than any other time, which is the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the two or three months right before a presidential election, when, you know, it's really hard to find news about anything else going on. It's really hard to follow any other issue. Yep. It's like, uh, it's really hard to discuss anything else and everything just turns into this. And it's like, wow, but there is a whole world that's still mm-hmm. happening, yep. you know, besides that. And, the the range of the political discussion here in the United States, so few people here, including people um, who on the left, realize how narrow it is, you know? Yeah. And yeah. It's, uh, it's become worse in a way. I mean, well, you know, you and I, you know, can, can listen to someone like, like Trump, you know, talk about Biden as being a, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, very left wing and we just laugh. <laughs> right. 
Yep. But you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of Americans, you know, buy that. You know, they believe it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. And, and and so it, it it would help, I think, a little bit to contrast. You know, talk talk a little bit more about like what what you know the spectrum is like in Europe and in France compared to the United States. That shows how narrow it is here. You know. Well, you know, both in 2016 and last year, you know, when there was that that kind of like six week window every time where where most of the attention was on Bernie and there was a, a, a slight uh, flutter of hope that perhaps he could actually be the nominee. Mm -hmm. Both times I, I was bombarded here with with people who were just so, so very, very confused um, as to why he was being portrayed, not just by right wing politicians, but by many media outlets and many citizens as either a communist or a socialist. Um, what they would most often say to me is, you know, as, as, as though the answer would be affirmative, they would say, don't Americans know what that word means? <laughs> and, and I would have to say, well, actually, no, you know, as, as to, to paraphrase a meme I, I once saw, you know, pretty much anything to the left of open season on the homeless is, is, is characterized as either communism or socialism, anything that has to do with, with acting empathetic and or, you know, being having an interest in the social rights and welfare of anyone who's not, you know, wrapped in a flag holding a Bible, that's communism or socialism. And, you know, a friend of mine here lives in Strasbourg, you know, when I when I first came here in 2016 and, you know, it was, it was during the election season when Obama was still president, I made the mistake of, of referring to the Dem, even though I don't really think they're left, but, you know, just using the American rubric I made a mistake of referring to the Democrats as the left. And she just looked at me and she laughed and she like, you know, she like got my eyes eye to eye. She's, then I remember in her heavy French accent, she's like, America has two parties, right and far right. Don't you forget that. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> 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 like, yeah. to, you know, to, to, and, and she's right. You know, she was right by, by European standards. Bernie is like center, center right. Um, ironically, like if I had to place Bernie's politics in a party, there's no party where he would fit in exactly, but especially when it comes to, to his foreign policy and then his kind of, you know, somewhat imperial views and his stance on Israel, you know, he, he would, he would be in the center right party here that ironically is called the Republicans. Huh. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, it's funny, people, people have a fondness for her here for constantly just telling off all the, the idiot old white men. It's, it's fun. Like she, mm -hmm. she has a good reputation here. Um, a lot of the more leftist media outlets have, have taken a whole lot of her clips and, you know, subtitled them in French, whether she's, you know, calling out the, the drug companies over the price of this or that whole thing, you know, last month, um, with the, with the representative, um, who tried to do, um, uh, justify his, his, um, misogynistic behavior by saying that he had a wife and daughter. That whole clip went viral here. Um, and so they really like her because she pushes against the establishment that they, you know, see for what it is. But even then, her politics themselves, they're kind of surprised sometimes when they actually look at her policies and they're not, they, they view her policies as not being as left as her attitude. I right. That's, that's the, ad, that's the, the vibe I get about AOC. They still like, I mean, she's, pretty damn i wish you know i kind of want to like i just want you to know you're really popular in france um, <laughs> <laughs> is i mean they even call her by you know by by aoc mm -hmm. um which is funny because uh uh aoc is also the um, um eu legal designation for like wines that are made in a specific region and can only have you know champagne has to be called champagne only if it's made in champagne because it's aoc so oh, we have to talk about which aoc we're talking about mm -hmm. the wine designation of the politician mm -hmm. um but you know here yeah the here the political spectrum actually goes from from actual right you know far right being the the national front but you know we have a, a communist party you know the parti communiste francais um, which has been around, you know, it's one of the, actually one of the oldest parties that exists. Um, and they're mainstream. They're not, you know, they, they don't win most elections, but, you know, they have enough, you know, they have represented, they have representation um, in both houses of Congress. They have, they definitely have an amount of political power that you would never imagine a communist party in, in the United States would have. And, you know, not everyone agrees with their politics, but they're not marginalized the way that anything that would ever call itself communist 
um, would be immediately marginalized in the United States. You know, they're taken seriously as a political force. Um, you know, we have at least there's three major parties that, you know, one is called the, the, the uh, Nouveau Parti Anticapitaliste, so the, the new anti-capitalist party, as opposed to the French Communist Party, which is the old anti-capitalist party. Huh, okay. um, and then you have uh, France Insoumise, um, which is um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, which is his party, which is probably like the biggest left wing party. And I, I wouldn't call him an outright communist. Um, but he definitely leads in that that direction. You know, he ran for president in 2017 and only lost the first round by a few percentage points. Um, you know, serious contender. Um, and it's, it's pretty much accepted in this. You know, people are looking at the, the um, election coming up, which will be in 2022. Uh, Mélenchon has not um, announced whether he's running or not. But in many ways, he's being seen right now as the only person who can possibly defeat uh, Marion Le Pen. Because um, there's kind of nobody else, you know. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> hates Macron so deeply, I don't think he has a <laughs> shot at re-election. Um, but somebody needs to go up against her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in many, you know, in many of the publications I read, he is being seen as the best shot. Um, you know, he gets compared to Bernie Sanders a lot. Um, but, you know, I'd say he's actually well to the left of Bernie Sanders overall. And, you know, again, so many of the, you know, the, the positions that we consider to be left that Bernie Sanders pushes are, again, they're positions that are not left here. Um, the idea of free college education, the idea of paid maternity leave, the idea of universal health care. These are things that both parties support 100%. There's nobody speaking out against those things. Those are just considered French values. And, and so, again, people will see Bernie as center or even leaning center right because they're looking at his foreign policy, which is much more in line with what centrists and or right wing parties believe here, um, as opposed to the left wing here, which, you know, takes an extreme, you know, a, a position that would be extreme by American standards. In terms of, you know, want, not wanting to be imperial, you know, remove all our troops from all our former colonies, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, you know, I think this leads, I mean, this leads to a whole lot of confusion. I shouldn't say I think. It does. It leads to a whole lot of confusion, especially around the American left. That, again, you know, they, they superimpose the American ideas of what is left and what is right onto the rest of the world. So they're going to assume that a party, a position, a movement that's fighting for things like labor rights, for example, must be inherently left wing. When no, um, you saw this with the Yellow Vest movement. That's the best example. Um, ah, I, mean, I was hoping I, you'd talk about them. Yeah, I mm -hmm. talked myself hoarse through the few months that like that was an American news story. I mean, I that was a full time job for me trying to talk to American anarchists who are so convinced, like, wow, look at this left wing anarchist movement. And like what they don't realize, like it was started by right wing conservatives. <laughs> it was started by right wing conservatives who didn't want to pay their gas taxes. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, <laughs> but those right wing, you know, they're rural right wing folks who, again, because they're French, they want a higher minimum wage. They want their retirement benefits to be respected and not fucked with. You know, they believe in things like universal health care, paid maternity, you know, that they're fighting a centrist government that's trying to take away those things. You know, the, the gilet jaune was the left and the right combined. And it's almost, you know, a, a, a slightly warped version of horseshoe theory. But that's because of the specifics of the French political landscape. Because the workers, you know, because again, here there's just much more of a class stratification. These aren't things that left or right believe in. These are things that workers believe in. Because these are the things that are the reason that French people have a good life. Everybody thinks you should have five weeks of vacation. Everyone thinks you should have paid maternity. Everyone thinks you should have generous retirement. These are things that, that everyone thinks you should have health care. Everyone thinks that you should have access to university. These are things that people see as kind of the pillars of, of society and why this is a society that people are proud of. Those are the things that people are proud of. In many ways, you know, that's how nationalism is expressed here is, is through those the idea that everybody has health care, not, you know, waving a flag and screaming about Jesus. <laughs>
<laughs> and so, yeah, the, you know, but Macron, you know, he's a neoliberalist. Macron is trying to, you know, and then he'll use words like he's trying to modernize and diversify the French economy and the French government. And what he really means is that he's trying to Americanize it. He's trying to privatize it. He's, he's trying to do what Reagan and Thatcher did. And people over here watched the British and American neoliberal project from either a channel or an ocean away, depending which one they were watching, for the past four decades. And they know full well where it ends up. They don't want to be like Americans. They don't want to be like the Brits. They don't want to, they, they want their good life. They've earned it, they've worked for it, and they don't want it taken away. And that's really so much of what the Yellow Vest movement was. It was a fight for French values against neoliberalism. And it was equally people whose, you know, personal political opinions I deeply abhor, deeply offended by, and people I consider comrades. Both of them were out there. And that's something that, yeah, the American left completely missed the boat on that one. And very conveniently, completely ignored and looked the other way at a whole lot of the, the problematic moments and problematic stances that happened in that movement, which came from the right wing contingent, who is Islamic, homophobic, you know, anti-immigrant. There was a lot of those mentalities coming out just as much as there was, you know, smash capitalism, smash the state, you know, <laughs> workers utopia for all, you know, all of those things were in there. And, and it was to me, it was a really, really fascinating illustration of just how different concepts of I mean, there's there's still many things that are similar in underlying left and right, for example, things like homophobia, equal rights, uh, anti immigrant, anti refugee, you know, those, those political positions are pretty identical between the left and the right here. But no, everyone supports health care. That's that's not a debate. <laughs> right. Everyone right. supports five weeks of vacation. No, nobody's fighting. No workers here don't fight against their best interests for ideological identity, politic, right wing type. You know, and again, so much of that is underlined by religion. Right. You know, there's this like, you know, when you look at the decades worth of poor Americans who fight for poli who, who vote for politicians that just screw them over and over again because those politicians won't shut up about Jesus and, and you know, and, and, and will reference their hometown, will reference their way of life. We'll talk about wanting to preserve their way of life and they fall for that. And and here, you know, those 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 values, the idea that, you know, the average person deserves this, that, and the other thing, and that they've earned them. And if you're trying to take it away, you're, you're stealing what we've earned, and we're going we're gonna to throw bricks until you stop trying to take it away. Uh, <laughs> I think that's always been very much, you know, the, the French spirit and the history of, you know, why, I mean, Fr France arguably has the, the strongest labor laws in the world. Um, and they gained those mainly through, through strikes and through violence and through militancy over the course of, you know, the past 80 years. And in many ways, we're, we're greatly influenced by, by the American labor movement. Um, I mean, people here often know more about the American labor movement than the average American does, especially left-wing folks. It, it's it's mind-blowing to me. I mean, I briefly, I briefly had, had dated a guy here um, who was, he was a part of the, the French Communist Party. Um, he was he worked with the with the local office and yeah he's sitting there he's telling me about like blair mountain he's talking to me about like haymarket he's just like rattling off all these stories he knows about like the american labor movement and i was just looking at him like wow i could never find an american that knows about like french labor history this way you know right. never <laughs> but he just he just knew all that stuff like the back of his hand because it was a big part of what they based their movement off of wow that's impressive yeah because, I mean, yeah. at this point, the labor movement in the United States is, you know, close to dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, but it was it was seeing those. And in many ways, you know, it was seeing the New Deal that pushed through the popular front here, that pushed through, you know, the first round of labor laws um, that gave people two weeks paid vacation. That was 1936. That was this the same, <laughs> literally within the same year time span as when the New Deal programs went through. But here they pushed it farther. I mean, to this day, Americans don't have any guaranteed vacation. Um, the mm -hmm. French had two weeks starting in 1936. And, you know, they got three, 
three came, I think, in 58. They got their fourth week after, like, 68. And then, again, they got their fifth week, I think, during Mitterrand in, in the 1980s. And now it's at five weeks. Every full-time worker gets five weeks paid vacation. And they don't have to they don't have to take only one week at a time. You know, they'll take three weeks in a chunk. They'll take four weeks in a chunk. The month of August, there's not much open outside the major cities. Everyone's on vacation. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... That's just amazing. It's um, Americans, uh, people here are, are so, um, I think that, that because we just don't even know that this stuff is going on, it really, it, I think it leads to the, to, the, to the cynicism and hopelessness of the politics here. Totally. It's isolationism. So much of it has to do with isolationism. And, you know, and that, that, ta- that taps into that, that um, exceptionalist ideology. If you believe you're the greatest country in the world, you have no reason to look anywhere else at how people are doing things elsewhere. You know, we talked about this a bit in the last podcast when talking about the pandemic and how Europe's handling the pandemic compared to the United States. It doesn't occur to the United States to look across the pond. Oh, look, they're doing that. That works. Hmm. Maybe we should try that. It just it does not occur to Americans. Uh, You know, uh, Americans have such a hard time just looking out. It is such a deeply, deeply isolationist country. You know, I would argue that amongst the, you know, the theoretically free countries, and I say that, you know, um, in comparison to, in contrast to like true totalitarianism, um, the, the United States is probably the most isolated free country in the world. And the, you know, the current mentality, you know, the Trump first, the American first, you know, that only adds to that. And now, you know, in, in insult on top of injury, you know, you, you have a situation where even those who want to get their passport can't right now. And a good chunk of the rest of the world is closed off to Americans who even want to see beyond their borders. Now it's not even an option. But, you know, only 42 percent of Americans hold passports. Wow, that's pretty low. Eight percent of them have never left. Yeah, that. That to me is 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 a huge huge part of so much of the mentality of so much. It's so easy to believe that Europe is a socialist hellhole if you've never been there, right? And or you know the people who say to me you know and I want to cry but like they've you know I've been to Epcot I don't need to go to Europe. Oh my god! <laughs> you've actually oh heard that. Oh my god! <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. Or here it's the opposite. Here are first time American tourists will they'll come out of the subway to the city center in Wren and that's the first thing they say. They're like, Oh my god, it looks just like Epcot and I'm like, Oh God. Oh how embarrassing. <laughs> oh la 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 la. Yeah. So Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> just like is that the only frame of reference? And I get it. But that's literally that's their frame of reference. They see half timbered houses. You know, in a cute little pub when everyone's drinking outside and, you know, big beer steins or whatever. And they're like, oh, my God, it looks just like Disney World. I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, oh. a lot a lot of U.S. Americans, of course, don't even travel within this no. country, you know? No, exactly. Exactly. I was reading or, you know, and they, or they just I mean, they just, and they so stay put. You know, and that I mean, that's a phenomenon no matter where you are. I mean, I grew up 25 miles outside of New York City. And the majority of people I went to school with, they still live either in that town or one to two towns away. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a few of us who got out. And one thing I, I've noticed immediately over the past um, uh, couple of years is there's a very obvious correlation in political attitudes between those who have never left and those who have seen the world. Right. You know, the, the most leftist of us are people who have either at least went to the other coast for a while um, and or spent some time living out of the country. And the ones who are the most stalwart Trump supporters are the folks I know who literally live in the same town we went to high school. 
um, and or their their only real experience, and I put real in quotes here, um, abroad is within the context of the military. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that is, is, you know, and that's another like such a f- problematic clusterfuck. You know, I'll get into arguments with people all the time, people who, you know, are trying to tell me that, you know, the, the most common one has to do with, you know, the, the so-called no-go zones, which, you know, don't exist. That that's that's literally that's like Fox News bullshit there. There there is no huge sections within Europe where there's Sharia law and white people can't go. That's just that's fake. Um, <laughs> and the, but the people who spread that are either people who are never left or people who have, you know, they they did two years in Germany in the army. And, you know, and, and, and they, they try to use that as a basis for having a qualified opinion. They're like, I lived in Europe just like you. And I'm like, no, you lived on an army base. I mean, that's like spending two years in a college dorm and saying you know how to live on your own. It's <laughs> not the same thing. You are living in like a summer camp. You, ne- you are surrounded by Americans. You never have to learn the language. You can buy all your food at the PX. Leaving the base for any reason is an option, is an exercise, an adventure. You've never had to deal with the bureaucracy of any type. You've never had to culturally assimilate. And because you're in the military, you're, you're, you're being you know, infused with an extremely right-wing pro-American view of both what's going on in Europe as well as the United States. So no, you don't get to say you've lived in Germany if you spent two years in the army on a German military base. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the, that's the kid in mom's basement telling me they know how to live on their own because they spent two years in the dorm at Rutgers. Like, it doesn't fly. It's not the same. Um, and I find it, frankly, kind of insulting when people try to throw that in my face in order to justify the existence of, like, racist bullshit. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and the towns uh, where the your, the U.S. bases are uh, tend to be affected uh, by this too. Oh, totally. I mean, that's the other thing. If you go into town, you're not you're not being welcomed by the locals. They're not yeah. buying you drinks. Like they 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 don't like your presence. You know, Germans. I mean, I'm not going to speak for all Germans. No group is a monolith. Um, but in general, I would say the average German living near a military base is, is slightly to moderately resentful of that American presence. Amongst other things, it reminds them of what happened 80 years ago in the in-your-face way that they don't really want to think about. Um, and, you know, the, the American military just tends to bring problems where they go. They tend to bring a certain amount of social issues. Um and, you know, and, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, the, the, the story that came out a couple months ago, and I, I guess he, he made good on it to an extent, where uh, Trump uh, threatened and then I guess signed an order to remove a good chunk of, of American soldiers currently stationed in Germany. Um, you know, from an American perspective, there was a whole lot of anger um, from a kind of, you know, pan-European concern about NATO and Russia perspective there was a definitely a certain amount of worry, but my German friends who live near military bases were like, woohoo. Yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, not so much, you know, if you own a business in that town, you're concerned, you know, those who are going to be economically hit, but, but in general, you know, our, 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 our soldiers are not necessarily welcome. So welcome abroad. Again, it's that, you know, that there was differing perceptions of what it means to be an American within the country and then out of the country. Yeah, you'll hear these same complaints in uh, Japan too. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. Yep. Yeah, definitely, definitely well known for like the um, high amount of um, sexual crimes that yeah. are happening. Oh yeah, in Okinawa. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Okinawa's the Okinawa's the big one. Yeah, definitely. And and it's just, I mean, of course, this is you know something that you know breaks my heart on almost a daily basis is how in the United States the idea of talking about shutting down the empire and bringing the troops home, you know, or even reducing the troops is just the discussion is completely off the table here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, this is what, you know, for me, it really reveals that there's no, that, that the Democrats are in no way left, you know, no. is that there is nothing anti-war about nope. them, you know, and the fact that, uh, Democrat voters want to think of themselves as anti-war, then project that desire onto their candidates. 
and exactly. call them that. And then that's, yeah, you know, and that's why, you know, the left parties here, you know, why they consider themselves left and why most people consider them left. At least, you know, they take that stance. They take that anti-imperial stance. They take that anti-war stance. They're like, no, you know, we shouldn't have troops here and there. You know, we, we, we should not be police. You know, I mean, France, it's 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 mostly limited, you know, to the, the former colonies. Um where, you know, the, the troops are there to, quote unquote, keep in peace and keep the order because there's such political chaos in those places, you know, as a direct result of, you know, what France did there combined with the, you know, economic stranglehold that the country still has. Um, but, you know, another another huge cultural difference that I think is very relevant um, between the two places is around the attitude around the military and the police. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a back of the blue here. Like that's not a thing, right? Right. <laughs> we, you see, you see more ACAB graffiti here than you you ever I ever have in the United States. Even uh -huh. though you know the the, the 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 abbreviation is an anglicism, but right. it's still it's everywhere. It is everywhere. Um, you know the the idea that that all cops are bastards. The idea that you know police aren't good. Um, that's a mainstream belief here. P and and the idea and nobody. Nobody tells military folks, except for maybe, you know, the, the far right fringe. No, nobody tells returning military soldiers, thank you for fighting for our freedom. Mm -hmm. They know that that's not what the military does. You know, the, the military <laughs> fights for empire. The, the military fights for, for hegemony. The military fights for profit. Um, and, and, you know, and, and part of that, I think it's easier for people to have that view in part because here you don't join the military out of desperation um the military for generations now has been the repository for poor rural and or urban americans who don't really have a shot at much in life and are are you know lied to by recruiters you know think that they'll get a college education out of it sometimes they do but sign up for health care and a decent salary in the gi bill right right here, anyone with a high school diploma has a constitutionally protected right to a space at a public university for free. So, and they have health care. So why would they join the military? Right. Yeah, because at the same time, we have like a, a school to prison pipeline and a school to military pipeline here. Yeah, exactly. And you have neither of those things here. You know, you don't have for-profit prisons here. And and again, there's just not this fetishization and valorization of either the police or the military, which, you know, in the United States starts super young. You know, I was talking to someone here about you know, like one thing that just shocks people just on the forefront is the idea of cops in schools. There's no cops in schools here. Every school has a nurse, not a cop. That's right. the difference between American, you know, American schools. You'll have one nurse in an entire district, but a cop in every school here, every school. I believe they even have a doctor like at least assigned to every school. But there's no police in schools ever. And there's no, you know, things like the D.A.R.E. program. You know, I can remember like as a child, the cops coming into school, teaching you about the, how the police work, trying to convince you that cops are your friends. Or, you know, programs like the Police Athletic League aimed at the poor. Those things just don't exist here. Um, they're, they're not needed. And again, there's just, there's this cultural attitude toward police that, that is much more based in class and based in history. Uh, no one thinks the police here protect and serve. They know what the police do. It's, it's not a, a left-wing radical idea that the police are, you know, <laughs> protecting capital and sustaining white supremacy. That's just something people accept as fact. It's, it's not a controversy. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you don't have those kind of, of, of attitudes. And, and it's much easier for people to be able to take a position, you know, even politicians, especially politicians, critical of the military or critical of war because it's not seen as being anti-French. The way any criticism of the military or the police, it's, it's immediately, well, that's just anti-American. Ah, that's an important yeah. distinction. Yeah, that's just, that's, you know, if anything, I think people see collective anger toward the police as, again, yeah, another important part of, of French values. You know, they know the history. You know, and, and, and a lot of that also, you know, that comes from the history of fascism and the connection between police and fascism. 
right? You know, you know, you know, in Germany, you know, the, <laughs> the Gestapo, you know, that was an abbreviation of the German where I don't remember the word. I'm not going to try to say it, but the German word for secret police, that was the secret police force mm -hmm. um, in France in occupied France. It was the national police that carried out the wishes of the Nazi party. It wasn't soldiers. It was the national police. In Paris in 1942, when they rounded up thousands and thousands of Jews from every single neighborhood in Paris, put them all in a bike stadium and carted them off to Auschwitz, of which only like 1% ever came home, that was the national police who did so. That was not French soldiers. That was not German soldiers. Those were the cops. And people remember that and people know that. And so, you know, they, they, they see, you know, you think of fascism, they see the police and they're not afraid to express it. I'll never forget, you know, the first ever like major protest I ever saw here was during the, um, the labor strikes in 2016 and the cops had barricaded downtown Bren and they, they weren't letting anyone go into the center because they didn't want people to try to set fire to the, the mayor's office and all that. Uh, <laughs> but I remember <laughs> like there was these like three little old ladies that like just bought groceries and wanted to get home little old you know nice white french ladies you know with with gold hoop earrings and nice shoes um mm -hmm. you know anything but anarchists and the cops wouldn't let them through and oh my god this woman let forth a string of profanities that i will never for like i didn't understand <laughs> half of them at the time but you didn't have to understand i just looked at the cop's face this like 85 year old woman was going off for like five minutes straight with the most like a cab attitude you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there thinking like, oh my God, like you would never, ever, ever see this in the United States. That she was just going. And then the other two lady and you had the three of them, man, like the, like the witches Macbeth, just, just losing their shit on the cops. And I was like, you know, and these, you know, but these are women who are of the age, you know, they remember World War II. Ah, uh, right. Occupied mm -hmm. France. Like they, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not bullshitted by any ideology about what the cops do. There's a bunch of folks in riot gear who won't let them go home. Right. And they're not having it. They're not fucking having it. And I remember just sitting there like a few feet away going, wow, that that's the grandma I want, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. And people here, you know, they're just not afraid of the police. They are not. And I know it helps to have universal health care. And it helps to have, you know, labor laws strong enough where you won't get fired for going to a protest. But, man, I watch people just go off. You know, I was in another. It was, it was a yellow vest protest turn right here last year. It was the same thing. I was just stuck downtown. Actually, this time I was those old ladies. I had done shopping. I didn't realize I was walking into the middle of a war zone. And so I'm, like, sitting there with my groceries trying to get home. I can't get home. I'm, like, cornered into this. And all, you know, and the, the police are coming forth with, like, riot gear. And all of a sudden, you know, just ordinary looking citizens just just overturn a dumpster of glass bottles and just start chucking bottles at the cops. Nice. And again, no, no black block, <laughs> no anarchists. Like these are like that guy could have been my hairdresser for all I know, you know? And again, I'm and I'm I'm ducking, like I'm under the police station, like or the, the bus station, ducking, like, oh my god, oh my god, you know, like like having a very American reaction. Um, and like, yeah, they're just chucking bottles for 10 minutes. The police finally back up. And then like two seconds later, it's just calm again. And everyone who is stuck like me is just like walking, you know, gingerly walking over the glass, broken glass, trying to get home. And I'm just like, wow. Like the, the degree to which, again, as an American, it was just shocking to me, the degree to which this was normalized. Right. You know, and it's right. always been that because it's always been that way. It is it is always social unrest here has been a constant. I think that one thing that Americans don't realize about themselves is just how damn obedient they are. Oh, my God. They're so obedient. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and this irony of being like, I'm so tough. I'm so cool. I can take care of myself. I don't need mm -hmm. anyone, blah, blah, blah. Right, the hyper, yeah, the, the, the hyper individualism combined with the, the obedience. Yeah, it is. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing to watch. We're here. It's, it's, you know, people are so much more collectively minded. But yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll chuck rocks at cops like on a moment's notice. You know, they'll, they'll break, they'll break wind. I mean, people here are amazed at how shocked Americans are. You know, the violence that's gone on, right? The property damage of the past couple months. 
like here we just call that Saturday. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, like there's literally a business in town, like their business is, is, is putting wooden boards over windows uh-huh. of corporate stores. Right. You'll see them out on Fridays. I mean, not every single, but you know, whenever there's like a social rest ep- unrest episode and during the yellow vests, you know, there was a good 18 months. I mean, really it was the pandemic that killed it. Right. I mean, that was going straight, you know, from, from the, the, the fall of 2018 until last February, last March. Almost every Friday you would have, you'd see, I'd see them drive up and down the main drags in Wren, you know, not every store, but the ones that would be targeted. So, you know, Foot Locker, all mm-hmm. of the banks, all of the, the, the property management offices. Cause you know, here, oh, you know, I give people credit. Like they, they generally won't bust up mom and pop. Right. Like they go for the targets. They go for capitalism. They know who the enemy is. Um, but all these companies would pay to have their windows boarded up. Because on Saturday, everyone's coming through with bricks. And if, if you have a real estate office and you're not boarded up, like you're, you got no glass, you know, you, or, you, or you use technically shatterproof glass, but it kind of shatters anyway. So you have what looks like bullet holes through your window that, that were made by a rock every Monday morning. Um, you know, there was a good six months last year where the expectation of taking out money on a Saturday was just not happening. It just wasn't happening. Like you knew to take out money on a Friday because Friday night, Saturday morning, every single bank machine in town was either boarded up or destroyed (laughs) and nobody works on Sunday. So it's not going to be repaired until Monday afternoon. Right. And so you're going to be able to get, you're not going to be able to get money out until Monday night. So you better get money out on Friday. Right. You know, that was one of the moments I realized I kind of culturally assimilated here was last, so, you know, like, I get up, you know, out of nowhere, I'm going out of the house and my husband's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to get money out. It's Friday. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Because I wanted to go to the market the next day and I knew full well that I wouldn't be able to access the cash machine. Right. Um, And people just accept, you know, it's acceptable. Like they know banks are the enemy. Mm -hmm. They may not approve of it, but they sure don't condemn it. They sure don't like clutch their pearls and play tiny little violins the way that Americans do. Right. You know, it, it's it's unlike Americans, they, they consider property secondary to human life. Um, so, you know, if we have to, like, smash windows for a year to make sure that people don't lose their retirement benefits like that, that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's considered a worthy uh, sacrifice as far as, again, not everyone. There's, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but the overall sentiment. It is definitely a, it's a very, very, very different regarding regarding property uh, destruction. Wow. I can see why um, you're not interested in coming back. No, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm really I miss I mean, I miss certain things. Um, the things I miss actually are often they're kind of embarrassing sometimes. Um, I miss Taco Bell and Waffle House. Um, <laughs> I miss I miss the aisle in the grocery store with all the cake mix and the frosting. Uh-huh. That totally doesn't. I miss I miss chicken broth in a can. That's super convenient. Totally doesn't exist here. Uh-huh. Um, you know, again, there's certain there's certain stupid little things that I miss. Um, I miss the I miss the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. I miss Coney Island. I miss the Berkshire Mountains. Um, I do not miss living in the United States, not one bit. Right. Um, and if I have, to, if I have to make a choice, you know, if, if not living there means I never eat Taco Bell again, I, I will be okay. Right. I, I, <laughs> I miss it. I totally admit. Um, I miss seven 11 too. Just that convenience factor mm-hmm. that like it's two in the morning and I'm drunk and I'm hungry. Um, here you got to cook something. Like that's unless you're in Paris, unless you're in a major city, like you're you're going home and cooking something. Um, there is there is no such thing as, as a 7-Eleven. There's there's a few 24 hour stores in Paris. That's about it. Uh-huh. Um, and almost nothing ever open on a Sunday. So, yeah, there's certain things about American life that I miss. Automatic cars. I miss that. Um, never learned to drive a stick shift and that's kind of screwed me over lately. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but overall, overall, you know, if, if anything, I deal with a very 
very culturally specific kind of, how would I describe it? It's a re- kind of a resentment and a rage and an anger that I deal with very often here. Um, being someone who comes from a country where I know full well how bad it is, where most people here don't understand how bad it is. And as a consequence, most people here don't understand how good they have it. Ah, interesting. And as someone who lived in the United States and for you know over a decade lived under the poverty line and had to attempt to, to deal with all of the bureaucracy and all of the help that doesn't exist and you know all of the everything that comes with being a poor American, um, I'll, I'll very often just you know be like you know in a bar with friends here and someone will casually mention that you know oh yeah I broke my toe so you know I haven't had to survive for the next two weeks which is like a note your doctor gives you that means you don't have to work but you still get paid uh-huh. and I'll just sit here like oh my god. Like, <laughs> like where I come from, you just lose your job Yeah. and then you lose your house yep. and then you're on the street mm-hmm. and then you're in jail cause you're on the street and then you never get out. Like, like, you know, as someone who worked with homeless populations for years, I'll just, yeah, things like that, you know, or, you know, I have, um, there's a, I mean, of, of so many social benefits here, for example, um, there's a yearly allocation for low-income parents to buy new clothes and school supplies for their kids. Oh, wow. You know, because that's what makes sense, right? You right. know, kids don't benefit when they go to school with holes in their shoes. Right. So you get a couple hundred bucks from the state to make sure your kids don't have, you know, shoes. with. So, you know, I see a GoFundMe the other day for a friend of mine in Oregon that, like, needs to replace her kid's shoes. Right. And and I sit here looking at my like you have no idea. You have no idea how good you have it. And they don't. And you know, life's not perfect here. There I mean, don't get me started on bureaucracy. Um, you know, they're, 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 this country has its own major cultural issues and social problems. But when it comes to day-to-day ease of life, when it comes to quality of life, you know, again, 5 weeks paid vacation taken for granted. Like I never in my life have I had a job with any paid vacation. I don't know what that's like. I don't know what that means. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and, you know, or housing benefits. You know, I spent four years on a Section 8 waiting list in Oregon, and then my number wasn't called. Here, anyone who needs it, you get it 90 days backdated. Boom. That's it. Wow. Like, and there's no, there's no HUD inspection. There's no, there's no limit. On, the only rule is the, the building can't be owned by a family member. That's really the only restriction. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. And I, that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And landlords, as opposed to Section 8, where no one wants to take it because, you know, you're poor, so you must be on drugs. Here they welcome it. Cool. It means the rent's paid. Awesome. Because it's so much harder to evict someone here. Because since the rental laws are so much more in the tenant's favor, if you have a rent guarantee from the state, you're seen as the optimal, the optimal tenant. Because that means that at least two thirds of your rent will always be paid and the landlord will never have to deal with you being able to live there six months rent free. Right. <laughs> so like stuff like that. I, I have a lot of cultural moments where I'll just look around at the folks around me and like I can't imagine what it must have been like to, to be born and raised in such an environment and to not have to see the suffering and the struggle that I witnessed for 35 years in the United States. Right. That That's the hardest part for me. And it's something that, you know, there's very few people I can talk about that with and empathize with here who get it because most other Americans I know here came from wealth. Mm. Most, you know, most people living abroad, you know, so-called expats, you know, they, they live here because they can afford to, um, you know, I came from a very different uh, background. And so it's, it's even the other Americans, they get what I'm talking about, but they never experienced it. Right. And, you know, and European and French people just they can't conceive of it. They can't conceive of, of not being able to get a housing stipend or, you know, not getting full unemployment or not being able to, to collect welfare, at least for a little while or just just all these things that, you know, people just, yeah, they, they really, you know, and again, I don't want to be harsh about it. Like, I get why they take it for granted. You know, the same way Americans take for granted that or they think they live in the greatest country in the world and never question it. Right. Like, you know, when you're when you grow up with something being normalized, 
there's no reason to think it's anything but normal. Right. But as as the immigrant here, you know, and that's what I am. I'm not an expat. I'm an immigrant. I came here for a better life. Um, I look around sometimes and I'm just like the experience of poverty here is so at least for citizens. You know, it's a different story when it comes to migrants and when it comes to refugees. That's where it's more like America. Right. But if you're a French citizen, your experience of poverty here is nothing like the United States. It's nothing. And that's something I will never get over. I think that's that's a trauma I will always carry. Right. Is the is the 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 background of of poverty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just knowing what it's like, not just for me, but for so many people I know and love, you know, people I know who have dentures because they couldn't get their teeth fixed. People I know who have, you know, injuries that will never heal. Um, you know, the first time I went to the doctor here, she wanted my medical history. And I'll never forget showing her, well, you know, I have this wrist that doesn't have full range of motion because I broke it. And then, yeah, here's my sprained ankle that never healed, you know, and she's just like, well, why? Like, why didn't you go to physical therapy? I was like, well, I didn't have health insurance, <laughs> you know, like, well, what do you mean your ankle never healed? I'm like, well, I, I didn't go to the doctor, you know, and it just didn't compute for her. It just right. couldn't. She just she because, again, she, I'm an American, so it's, it's assumed I have money. So uh -huh. the idea that I have this this ankle that I've had to favor for 12 years because it never healed right, it just blew her mind. She just, just, just wow. So she probably never came across anyone in her office who, who had such a thing. Whereas, like, how normal is that in the United States to have, you know, yeah, this finger doesn't work. Yeah, that shoulder doesn't work. That's just, that's what we've normalized. That's what we live with. And people here don't live with that. Right. And so, you know, sort of what I'm hearing here, and maybe to kind of look towards, towards wrapping the discussion up, is that is that in France there, there is um, a better system for taking care of people, um, in part because people uh, want those things, feel that they deserve those things, are willing to fight for those things. And then, by contrast, in the United States, we have a population that doesn't even know that these are possibilities, you know, to a great degree, and then uh, is really good at being mean at each other about it. Yeah, exactly. That's really it. And think they don't deserve it, you know. And and again, it's that it's that belief in meritocracy, and that belief in anyone who works hard enough can make it. You know, it's it's how you know poverty in America is is mostly seen as a personal failing. Whereas poverty here is seen as a structural failing. And so because it's a structural failing, yes, by all means, take my tax dollars and fix that. Whereas, you know, in the United States, the attitude is, well, I don't want my money going to buy that guy a house because he was lazy and didn't work. Right. That, that's really that that is really such the the, the underlying part of it. Um, it is it's that cult of rugged individualism. It is that that toxic downside of the American dream. And again, it's that Calvinist, and, you know, it just comes down to Calvinism. The rich are rich because they worked hard and they deserve being rich because God favors the, you know, that why, why do evangelicals love Trump? He must have done something right. It's OK. It's OK that, that you know, he's a rapist. It's OK that he did this. It's OK that he did that. I'm sorry, alleged rapist uh, right. <laughs> because because he's rich and therefore you know, and God favors the rich. So he must he must be good with God. Because he's rich. That is that is is Martin Luther and John Calvin to a T. And that is the ideology that, that the United States was founded on. Whereas, you know, here, you know, pff, here the history is of a very severe religious intolerance uh, <laughs> toward Protestants mm -hmm. <laughs> to the point where they were all exiled from the country at one point and or, you know, killed in mobs. Right. <laughs> which, you know, wasn't a good thing, but it just shows the the deep, deep, deep opposition to, to aspects of, of the ideology that underpins the United States. Right. And, and and being that that's that's underpinning it and has been underpinning it to one degree or another uh, from the beginning. I mean, this does kind of circle now back around to the original quotation I was reading from you. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. About, I was just thinking the same yeah, thing. Mm -hmm. about the United States needing to fail and and how oh. it can't really do anything but at this point because there there's just no there, there there's no solution when we're not willing to talk about these things. Exactly, and it's something that even if today. Even if tomorrow 
there was a nationwide, okay, look, here's our rot. Let's tackle this. That's still generations worth of work to undo that ideology. Right. Even if everyone, you know, made a national decision to start tomorrow, that's nothing you can fix in a few years. That that's generate that it is 300 years worth of ideology of, of yes, a, 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 a nation, you know, like we romanticize, you know, the pilgrims and the first folks, you know, the Massachusetts Bay Colony of, you know, amongst I have an ancestor who helped found it. So I know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, those, those weren't folks seeking religious freedom. Those were folks seeking the right to start a religious theocracy. Those were those were the Puritans. Those are the folks who wanted to rule with an iron hand and burn at the stake anyone that they disagreed with. That was the founding of America. And the only way to, 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 to push that forth and to expand it was through land theft and genocide and later on slavery and, you know, leading to, to you know, a different form of slavery we have with a nonprofit prison industrial system. This is what it's always been. This is the, that's that's the foundation. And, you know, when the foundation is rotted in a house, you don't build a new house on the foundation. You have to build a new foundation. I mean, it's that whole, you know, bad apples metaphor that, that people constantly get wrong when they're trying to, like, defend a bad cop. When there's a couple bad apples in the barrel, you get rid of the whole barrel because the rot has already spread in ways you can't see. You can't just pull out the apples. You have to start anew. And, you know, but between the size, the, the amount of polarization, the, the founding values of it and where it's led today, yeah, I, I don't see a way to, to fix it. I don't think it can be fixed. And I think that, you know, pe people really need to look at what they need, at their priority of their own future, how to best protect themselves, how to best secure themselves, how to live through what's coming. Because this, this, this cannot be fixed from here. Um, when I listen to people go on about, you know, the past several months with the pandemic and how, you know, these are the worst times, these are the worst times I can imagine. What I say to myself is like, I'm so terrified. I'm going to look back in five years and, and be begging for these times. I do think it's going to get much, 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 much worse from here. Um, I'm in, enjoying the freedom I have now because I don't know how long it's going to last, even over here, because it's a global problem. You know, liberal democracy has the same exact fatal flaws anywhere it's exercised. It's more functional in France than the United States, but this, it's got the same root rot. And when you look at, you know, the, the ever gaining power of the right wing throughout Europe as well, it's only a matter of time. This is a global problem. And yeah, I don't, I don't see you fixing the kind of value system that far too many Americans just, just not only believe in, but, you know, it's like the bedrock of their identity. Like, you don't you don't snap your fingers and fix that. Do you see the worldwide ascendancy of the right wing as being related to the uh, well, what we're seeing now, I think, is industrialism, uh, you know, is, is playing itself out at this point yeah. simply because of resources running out and also yep. because the planet itself is, is starting to, exactly. to reject it. Yep. It is a combination of the, the end result, you know, what we call end stage capitalism, late stage capitalism mm -hmm. combined with climate change. Right. Which, you know, is, is affecting folks who are in places that aren't even industrialized. But they're right. fl fleeing to the industrialized world because where they're living, they can no longer live. And that is, you know, because of the effects of industrialization that's affecting, you know, whether it's the, the global south in the Americas or, you know, northern Africa, the Middle East here. Exactly. It's this, you know, the entire world is going through different iterations of the same issue. The border crisis in the United States and the refugee crisis in Europe, there are different people fleeing from different places to different places. But it was pretty much for the exact same reasons in, in terms of a, a combination of meddling and colonialism on the part of Western powers, industrialization and climate change. Like that, that's, that's what's spearheading all of this worldwide. 
And I don't, I don't see a way out, you know, I mean, the over here, you know, the, the migrant crisis is, is probably between that and the pandemic. I don't know which is going to, to destabilize Europe quicker or faster. But I, I would be very surprised if the EU lasted more than another decade. Right. And once the EU goes, fuck it. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's that's. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a, a fan of, of the EU in, in many regards. Um, but as someone who goes out of their way to see both sides of anything, I can tell you that it has been the, the, the biggest factor in why there has been relative peace throughout the EU member states since World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, once those once those treaties break down, once once those open borders break down, um, you actually end up in a different version of, of the same material conditions that, that caused Hitler to invade Poland. Right. right. Like, how are we going to eat? <laughs> People always forget that part. <laughs> a big part of the invasion of Poland is Germany can't feed itself and Germany still can't feed itself. And Germany eats well and cheap. Because all those Southern European countries that the Germans shit on at the EU level and constantly like fuck over with austerity policies, they're the ones feeding them. The same way the same, you know, Mexican undocumented workers that Americans want to kick out of the country are the reason why Americans eat. Oh, definitely. We can't the the agricultural industry in the United States would not survive no. without those workers at this point. I mean, I yeah. you know, I, I would think, you know, we need to take yet another step back here and be like, okay, as a species, you know, who is, uh, you know, made a number of choices that are now coming to, to bite us, you know, if we were interested in our uh, survival as a species, we would uh, inevitably see at this point that the idea of the nation state itself has run its course and is now hindering us, not helping us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's recognized here, you know, when, when you look at the amount of, of independence movements throughout Europe, you know, and I'm, I'm living in the heart of one of the strongest. Um, there, there's many things that that underwrite why those movements exist and why they are so strong. But things like like like, you know, local food sovereignty and just the, the recognition that the the current systems that that keep all of us collectively running are not at all working and will fail sooner than later. That's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting because you know you you see, I mean, you know, you see movements. <laughs> you know, I remember Tex- Texas tried to secede once. I think Alaska did too. Now you have things like Cascadia and the state of Jefferson, um, California. And most of them are just, you know, right wing people with guns who don't want to pay their taxes. Right. Uh, Staten Island seceding from New York. That's that's a very similar one Uh, here. On the other hand, while there's definitely a left and a right with most of them, you know, most of the independence movements throughout Europe are are more left than right. Definitely. Um, And they're looking at those histories and they're looking at the future and, you know, they're also looking at, at just cultural preservation and, you know, and, and, and frankly, being tired in, you know, the same kind of 500 year battle against a nation state that, you know, you have in the United States with 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 Native Americans or you right. have in Canada with the First Nations. Um, it's it's pretty much the same fight, in, in, you know, with with a completely with a, with a slightly separate costume. Right. But it's. You know, and, and people here see that, you know, people here see that, you know, very, very clearly and plainly. Um, and, and, you know, and they're very much in solidarity with the other movements against nation states that are happening at the same time. Um, that's one of the few things that kind of gives me a certain amount, at least more hope for the survival of Europe um, than for what I see in the United States right now. You know, I see the, the nation state. Um, system, you know, uh, framework, it is not, it is not sustainable, is not for long. But at least here, the idea that we need to plan for something for what comes next is more than just a fringe movement. Um, in the U.S., it's still, it's, again, it's either a fringe movement or it's, you know, right wingers with guns. Um, that's definitely not something the average person has thought much about, which again, you know, goes back to exceptionalism, goes back to that whole, it can't happen here. 
Um, if there's anything I've been saying like a broken record for the past year, it's, it can happen there. It is happening there. Wake up, pay attention, make plans, like pull, pull forth the worst case scenario in your head. E e even if like you can't conceive that it would ever be a reality, force yourself to think that way and ask yourself, what would you do? Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.